Thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, this is the fourth in our virtual uh, series of pre presentations during this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, hopefully we won't have to do that many more of these, but I suspect we'll have a, a number in the future. We actually have one already lined up for next Wednesday where we will have um, the CEO of NASDAQ, Adina Friedman, talking about the impact on her companies, technology companies, others on NASDAQ. And we'll also have Ted Geyer, who is the uh, Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at the Brookings, Brookings Institution. So they'll talk about the business world and the economic world. Today, what we wanted to do is to have five individuals in two different segments. The first two individuals will be in the segment relating to the healthcare world and what's going on in hospitals. And then the second segment will deal with individuals who are dealing with major problems uh, associated with the COVID-19 crisis and what their companies are doing to assist in that crisis. So uh, this morning, in the first segment, we'll have Dr. Stephen Jones. Dr. Stephen Jones is the CEO of Inova, which is a Northern Virginia-oriented uh, healthcare provider. And I'll talk about more about what Inova is in a moment. Uh, he is, by training, a medical doctor, a, a urolo urologic oncologist. Um, he has previously been the president of the Cleveland Clinic Regional Hospitals, and he assumed his current position um, at Inova in 2018. Um, and he is trained as a medical doctor at the University of Arkansas Medical School, where he also did his undergraduate work. Uh, we also have with us today Ken Samet, who is the CEO of MedStar, which is a healthcare provider that's focused more on Maryland and, and the District of Columbia. And it is a very large healthcare provider in those areas. Uh, Georgetown Hospital, for example, is a part of MedStar system. Uh, Ken is somebody who is a graduate of Old Dominion and then did his, did his graduate work in healthcare studies at University of Michigan. And he has uh, uh, been in charge of this position and current position since 2008. Previously, he was the chief operating officer uh, for uh, MedStar from 2003 to 2008. So we're very pre pleased to have both of you here. And if I could, uh, uh, let me just ask you if I said something incorrect about your organization. Uh, Stephen Jones, have you were to describe uh, Innova, very quickly, how would you describe it? Yeah, we've got five hospitals all here in the Washington, D.C. area, as you mentioned, in Northern Virginia, uh, and all of our hospitals have been rated by CMS Five Star, so quality and safety are the key issues for us, and they've certainly been important here in these recent days. Okay, and uh, how, Ken, how would you describe your organization better than I described it? Certainly nobody can do it better than you, but uh, 10 hospitals, uh, including the major academic medical centers of Georgetown and the Washington Hospital Center across the state of Maryland and the district, and 300 other care sites as we touch the communities across the broad region. Okay, so for both of you, uh, in a normal situation, forget COVID-19 for a moment, uh, Stephen, how many patients would you be seeing uh, in a year? Your system sees how many patients a year? We take care of about 2 million patients here in Northern Virginia. Okay, and Ken, how many do you sit typically see a year? So I answer that question by saying we, we touch one in five across the region. Um, okay, so uh, for both of you, how many COVID-19 people are you now um, helping in your hospital system? Ken? So we've seen real growth. Today we had 203 COVID positive patients in our hospitals, about another 75 what we call PUIs, persons under investigation that could be positive. We have to treat them that way until testing comes back. That is up from 50 just a week ago, and that's an important set of numbers that we can dive into at some point. Okay. Stephen, how many are you treating? We're seeing a similar rise in the number of cases. We've had a total of 370 positive cases. As of seven o'clock this morning, our last report, we had 116 patients. Uh, 34 of those were in intensive care. Okay, so if you watch television, you see what's going on in New York. Uh, what is going on in New York hasn't yet hit the Washington area. Is that correct? You don't have uh, people who are um, unable to even get in the hospitals. You're not a lack. You're not lacking in hospital materials, gowns, uh, masks. Is that correct, both of you? That's correct. Right. And right. So uh, now you have presumably stocked up. So did you have a hard time getting the the, the masks, the gowns, uh, the other kinds of things you need, or you did not have a problem? So I'll jump in and then Stephen could add to that. I think uh, it is clearly one of the national issues. You're talking to the two CEOs of two very strong healthcare systems. So we were on this early. We have normal supply chain that works this. And I would say that for MedStar, Stephen will answer for Inova. We are certainly good today, but that is a relative word. If we have a surge like what we see in New York City, 
no one is ready for a peak that is not controlled, which is why keeping everybody home, social mitigation matters. But today, we have supplies to keep our people safe. We are working supply chain every single day, and there is an underbelly of that that's not pretty going on around the globe right now. When you say that, you mean you have to fend for yourself? You mean the FEMA is not getting you what you need or the governor is not getting you what you need? I mean, everybody's trying. We clearly are working for ourselves. We're using all of the connections we have. We've actually benefited from some of the members of the Economics Club, and I thank them who have contacts around the globe. But everybody is working for their own organization. We'll always work together, and Stephen and I have had many phone calls together. FEMA's working, the governor's working, the White House is working, but you have to take care of your own organization first. Okay, Stephen? Yeah, fortunately, we started back in January hoping that we were um, preparing out of an abundance of caution and that we wouldn't need what we had. Uh, as it turns out, obviously, we do. So we're in very good shape right now. It's obviously evolving uh, significantly, and I hate to predict the future, but right now, we're in very good shape. So let's suppose I am scheduled for elective surgery at one of your hospitals. Um, are you calling me up now and telling me not to come in because you have a lot of COVID-19 people hanging around, or you have your professionals working on other things. What are you telling elective surgery people? So we told you that two weeks ago. We actually stopped uh, all elective surgery procedures into our medical offices back on the 19th of March. Um, so as part of preparing for a surge and being responsible, the, all the hospitals in this region have done that and did that several weeks ago. Okay, but let me make sure I, go ahead, Stephen. I think the important thing on that, David, is that we stopped doing those operations not because as much concern for safety related to COVID as uh, we want to preserve all of our PPE, our personal protective equipment for use because we believe that the need for that will be increasing. So that's really the most significant reason we're doing that is to make sure we re use our resources and keep our hospitals able to take care of whatever number of patients come okay. forward. But let me make sure I understand. So you, let's suppose you're a doctor who is a specialist in, let's say, cancer. Um, right now, COVID is not a cancer. So what are those doctors doing? Are they able to transfer their services a bit in the COVID-19? Are they staying home? Or are they, what are they doing? Our surgeons, uh, for one thing, there are still, of course, urgent surgical cases. So it's not that the operating rooms have stopped completely, although significant drop from before. But there are situations where people have you know, heart attacks, uh, specific cancers that can't wait, that are still having their surgery as they would have. But anything that's, quote, non-urgent, we put off. I just okay. add to I would just add to Stephen's comments and say, so all of these are critical essential resources. All of the physicians, even if they're in a space there where they're not practicing today because perhaps they were doing elective orthopedic cases, they're all going to be redeployed. We're actually training them. We know vent management, as an example, will be a significant issue as we see the surge come at whatever level it comes. Those surgeons actually used to, they knew how to train on a vent. They knew how to do that a long time ago, but they haven't done it in a while. So we are training up, getting them ready for a surge to come. So the surge you expect to come in the next one week, two weeks, three weeks, what is your, what is your uh, modeling telling you when the surge is going to come? So no one knows for certain, but the modeling all certainly says for our area in the next seven to 14 days, the issue for everybody, when they hear surge, they immediately think New York City, and our great hope is that, and there are reasons why, we don't believe the surge has to be at that level here, but there is significantly going to be an increase uh, under the definition of surge coming. Okay, uh, Stephen, you agree with that? I do agree with that, and it's, it underscores how important it is that people continue to, to be serious about social distancing, is that the, the more that we keep that surge at a manageable level, the more that we can assure that everyone's taken care of appropriately as they would have any time been in the past. The, the surges that you've seen in New York and other places uh, are obviously tragic, uh, and we want to do everything we can to prevent that. Now, um, I am, fortunately, I'm feeling okay right now as I'm talking, but, you know, I'm always a hypochondriac, I'm always thinking something's going to be wrong, and I've always got some problem that, uh, you know, some doctor can fix. So let's suppose I say, I just want to make sure that I don't have this uh, problem, this disease, this virus. Can I just walk into your hospitals and get a test right now? That'd be a really bad idea uh, for, a, for, a, lot of, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of reasons, but I will say what you can do, and this is one of the glass half fulls that is going to come out of this. 
uh, healthcare systems around the country, and I'll just speak for MedStar, have really stood up a phenomenal platform for telehealth and e-visit that is so much more significant than where we were before this started. And you could have a visit that way. And let me just give you some numbers. We were seeing maybe 25 patients a day on our telehealth platform before COVID. The adoption rate around the country on that is low. Yesterday, we did 2,000 of scheduled appointment e-visits with our MedStar Medical Group physician. So if you need to see a doctor, you can do that. You're just not gonna walk in the hospital. And that is gonna be part of how healthcare gets provided okay. long after COVID's behind us. All right, but let's suppose I actually have a fever and I really feel pretty bad. Um, should I come in then? What we would strongly recommend is that you contact your own healthcare provider, let them know that you've got symptoms that you think are, are suspicious for COVID and then you would be directed to a place that's set up to assure the right care. We set up what we call respiratory clinics that are in what historically were urgent care clinics all around Northern Virginia. And in those places, people call, they get an appointment, they come in, they're pre-screened, as Ken said, by a telehealth visit. And if indeed they meet the criteria for that, they come in and they get tested in their cars. I, I happen to have the pleasure of visiting one of them yesterday afternoon and I was the only person who pulled in the parking lot who didn't undergo testing for COVID, and they've really got it down pat, and importantly, aren't using personal protective equipment that's more needed for other causes. They can then concentrate that. Well, let's suppose I uh, want to drive by and get one of your drive-by tests to see whether I have it, and let's suppose it says, how long does it take to get the results? So, I'll let Stephen answer for his, then I'll jump in on testing. Okay. Yeah. Testing has been a, a real challenge, as the, the headlines are very accurate, is that uh, right now we still have patients who we were sending tests out to labs and it's taking up to 10 to 14 days in certain circumstances. We are bringing testing in-house and expect to have that imminently to be able to do our own testing with the only limitation being the reagents or the chemicals that are required for the testing. Otherwise, we've had the equipment placed now for probably uh, several weeks. So this is a really important issue just to add to Stephen's comments because uh, the public doesn't understand and there were statements made at some point that said everybody could have a test if they want a test and that's actually just not uh, doable. We don't have capacity for that. It might not even make clinical sense today, but clearly we can't do that. So to Stephen's point, if you came in to get a swab testing at one of the drive through sites. Uh, again, like Stephen, we've set one up in Bethesda. We have one in Baltimore. We use our 14 urgent care sites. But if you're an, on an outpatient basis prescribed by a doc to get that swab, they go to the big commercial labs, Quest or LabCorp, anywhere from six to eight days to more, as Stephen said, for turnaround. And if you don't have a high fever and other symptoms, go home, stay self-quarantined, assume you're presumptively positive. We right, brought up platforms, just to finish one thing, David, we did bring up four rapid cycle platforms at MedStar. So today, we can run 500 tests between 45 minutes and six hours. That's all focused on inpatients, on PUIs, and on our healthcare associates. That's the start point. If everybody can ramp up more on that, to Stephen's point, if there's more reagents, we'll be able to do more on the ambulatory side, but not today. Well, let's suppose I have a fever, I come in, I drive by, I won't get the results right away. Should I get admitted to the hospital or should, or should I go back and back to my house? I mean, how do you decide who to admit and who not to admit? I'll let the doctor answer that. Remember, I'm a cancer surgeon, Ken. Uh, <laughs> but So our, our clinicians who are now very familiar with seeing patients with okay. uh, COVID-19, they, they would assess you as they would with any other condition, for example, influenza. And as you know, people also get seriously ill with influenza or sometimes even uh, pneumonia and other diseases that we don't even know the cause, but these patients can get intensely um, ill quickly. So that if you are indeed in any way unstable or appearing to have significant breathing problems, you would be admitted to the hospital. Otherwise, Ken's made the point, the more that people go and stay away from anyone else, the better probably for them, uh, because most patients will coalesce completely without significant intervention. And then we assure that we okay. use that so more intensive care for them. The, the individuals, as we've seen Chris Cuomo on television, he now has this, but he's not going to a hospital. He's trying to deal with it at home. But how do you decide if you need to be just self-isolating and kind of sweating through this problem, or if your life is in danger and you really need to be in a hospital and get a ventilator? Who makes that decision, the patient or the doctor? So you would call a doctor should do that, yeah. 
he would call your physician and again from a from fever from shortness of breath from the constriction in your in your chest and we're going to bring you in if we're worried the physicians are going to make that call and those are the patients that are in the hospital now and you heard steven's numbers and mine whether they're COVID positive or we don't know yet but those are the ones that are absolutely coming in and the ones who are coming in and getting admitted are they tend to be what i'll call baby boomers who are like me who are aging or are they younger people so it actually runs across the gamut. Everyone knows that the mortality rate's higher for certain underlying cohorts and, and the elderly, but across the country, the young people were wrong when they thought this couldn't impact them. And we're seeing that across the board uh, to include, unfortunately, even now a few infants around the country. Everybody should take this very seriously. Now, we've heard a lot on television about the lack of ventilators. Why are ventilators so important? And do you all have enough ventilators for the surge you anticipate? So, so I'll speak for MedStar, then Stephen could speak. Today we have ventilators available, and you know, the 200 patients in-house, about 60% are on a ventilator, and we have more. Your question, though, said for the surge you anticipate, and I think every single healthcare provider, every CEO, including me, is worried about ventilators because if the surge is too big, there's not enough ventilators. And a ventilator is something that is put you, you put it down your, your throat and um, you are sedated when that happens. And how long are you on a ventilator typically? Go ahead, Ken. So the average right now around the country is 10 to 14 days for patients that end up, a COVID patient that end up on a ventilator. There's obviously exceptions on, on both ends. Um, and so again, everything about this discussion uh, for every hospital around the country is keeping people from being seriously ill, from getting COVID. Everything after that, if you get this, becomes to multiply for the country. Remember, about 80%, 82% of the folks that actually end up with COVID, they don't need to be in a hospital. They're mildly ill. You'll be fine. Stay in the house and take care of yourself. The rest of the discussion is around the other 18%, and that's where the end matters. If we don't control this, and we had the broad numbers like we do for the flu that have COVID, Given that it is a higher mortality rate and it is more infectious, that overwhelms the healthcare system. Everything about staying at home is so we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. And remember, we have heroes at Inova, heroes at MedStar, at every hospital around the region and the country that are coming in, that are putting themselves selflessly in harm's way. And we have to be able to have enough PPE to keep them safe. They have to feel that the care environment's safe because if they don't feel safe and they don't come in, then we have a really different situation. Well, let me address that. And Stephen, let me ask you about it as well. Uh, are you having of your healthcare workers say, well, they're sick and some of them are coming down with COVID-19 or some of them taking leaves of absences because they're nervous or are they just coming in and just working around the clock? We certainly have had some of our, our team members who have had COVID exposures that we've had at various times, two or three dozen, who we've had home on self-quarantine mainly early on before we had our understanding of who needed to be quarantined. Fortunately, all of those have done very well. And in fact, many of them are back to work right now. As far as being willing to come to work, it's been almost the opposite. Although every single person is nervous about this, of course. Uh, we, for example, I was in um, our cardiac intensive care yesterday. So an area that normally doesn't take care of anything like this, we've converted it to take care of these patients. They had 30 extra shifts they asked for volunteers for. It took less than 10 minutes to get those shifts to all fill up. So. Uh, our people are just, as Ken said, in both organizations doing inspirational work. So uh, today, um, your healthcare workers are just basically doing the same precautionary things as other people, washing a lot, wearing gloves, uh, so forth. Now, is there's a dispute, uh, and I think the federal government's going to try to make a comment on it today, perhaps, about whether you should wear masks. Do you recommend that people generally wear masks? So there's two things on this. The federal government's going to make a statement supposedly around people wearing masks out in public spaces. <clears throat> That's different than what Stephen and I have to deal with relative to should everybody wear a mask in a care environment. And again, we've moved some from perfect science to how do we protect even incrementally inside the care environment, in a hospital environment, because people can spread asymptomatically. We are actually giving masks now. We have been doing this for a week to anybody that comes into our hospitals as just an incremental addition to keep our healthcare workers safe. That is different than should you wear a mask on K Street. Um, well, should you wear a mask on K Street? 
there's not enough masks for everybody. You stay home, stay away from folks six to 10 feet. Um, you know, if you really feel like you want to put a scarf around yourself, do it, but, but stay home. I have one. Okay. So very, very strongly, uh, if we use those masks inappropriately, then they won't be available for people who need them. And you've unfortunately seen that in a couple of parts of the country already. Now, there's been a big discussion about the M95 masks. Can you explain what M95 mask is? Sure. That it's a mask specifically to theoretically keep 95% of pathogens, whether it be viruses or bacteria, from passing through. So it's just a, a theoretically more secure mask. There are some studies that, that would suggest that it's not as much better than a surgical mask as perhaps is believed, but uh, there are certain circumstances, especially what we call aerosolizing uh, procedures where droplets may be put out or in patients who are COVID positive where we do uh, assure that people have those masks. So to date, um, do you think that what COVID-19 is, is it, is it a, a, a virulent strain of an influenza or is there something different in influenza? It's a different bacteria. It's a different class of bacteria. Coronavirus is a very common virus. Probably everyone who's watching today has had a coronavirus at some point, uh, frequently a common cold. This is a novel, meaning new coronavirus, uh, which is clearly more virulent than most of the ones that any of us have been exposed to historically. So let me ask you what both of you are doing. Uh, you know, you are important people in the healthcare system, but you have to stay healthy. So what are you doing to stay healthy? Uh, uh, Ken, what are you doing to stay healthy, and how do you uh, keep going in these hours you're going to have to work? So I wish I had a really great healthcare answer and say, well, I'm running each morning, and I'm really taking care of my health and eating healthy. That actually is not right. Uh, so I, I think for me, um, you know, there's energy that comes from our people. This, uh, the ability to actually have, do Zoom with your families on weekends and to see my kids and make sure my parents are safe, that's, that reminds me why I'm doing this. But, but we all are trying. This is a long run. The biggest difference is, unlike anything else I've seen from SARS to anthrax to 2008, uh, even to 9-11, we're not even at halftime yet. So to your point of staying healthy, I think everyone's getting a little tired and we have to figure out how to balance this marathon. Stephen, what are you doing? I think the most important thing is, that Ken said is being inspired by the people who are really doing the work. Uh, and you know that's why I'll be out at Nova Loudon this afternoon uh, because it keeps me energized and focused on doing everything we can to protect them. In, in addition, everybody should be taking care of themselves. I happen to have my little uh, hand uh, stuff here to sterilize with, but hand washing is by far the most critical thing in addition to not being around people where you may be spreading, especially if you may be ill. So if you want to go get some food to go to the supermarket, uh, I guess you guys probably aren't going to the supermarket right now, but I mean, how does somebody go to the supermarket and not see somebody else? It's the greatest thing for 32 years of marriage. Let me just thank Stacy for having food when I come home. Okay. I, I will acknowledge I'm probably not the best supermarket person, but my wife, Catherine, has uh, become a uh, frequent user of Instacart recently. And when they mm -hmm. come in, they've been nice. And when they come in, we do, of course, do the appropriate things to clean off just in case. So what can the business community or the members of the Economic Club of Washington do to help you? What, or stay out of your way, or what should they do? So maybe I'll jump in and Stephen could add. I mean, first, thank you very much for keeping your people at home. Uh, the generosity of business leaders matters. I'm sure Stephen will comment. You could go to the MedStar COVID webpage. And for us, we're doing fundraising for an emergency support fund for our associates. While they're being heroes, Again, it could be their spouse, uh, their family. They have lots of needs. We started an emergency fund at MedStar. We put $2 million into it. And I've been really pleased to see the support of the community and business leaders. And then finally, I just want to thank business leaders, including a number on this call. Uh, your text and emails have mattered. And a number of you have contacts around the world, and you have really helped us. And I will never forget that. Stephen? It's been overwhelmingly gratifying of, of many people, including on this call right now, have reached out to us, helping us with financial support. This is a, fi a significant financial event for every healthcare organization, uh, including helping us get personal protective equipment occasionally. I will acknowledge there's lots of gougers out there that unfortunately we see way more of that than anything else, but we have been able to get uh, care with, with that. But the support from the community, including simply reaching out to those people on the front lines who are indeed putting themselves in harm's way for all of us uh, is very appreciated. Now, the financial impact on your hospitals, let me address that before we conclude. Please. 
Um, the, I think under the recent legislation, I think it was $150 billion is going to be provided to hospitals. Is that going to make up for all the losses that you have are presumably suffering now because you're not doing your normal business? It's, it's a start and we're appreciative. Um, I, what I would say, and Stephen could jump in on this, this is the single biggest financial challenge or crisis in the history of American hospitals in my three decades of leading hospitals. Just know that our hospitals are 30 to 70% empty right now in preparation for the surge. We're doing all the right things. That does not count the tens of millions of dollars we're spending on PPE and capacity and our people. At the end of all of this, we will need to rebuild and re-solidify America's hospitals. And the 110 to $120 billion that we'll see, assuming that we'll see it, it is important, but I would say it is it, it, it needs a four or five X before this is all done. Stephen? Yeah, Ken's clearly right on the math there. The way I've looked at this is, uh, as some of our colleagues in New York and in Italy before that have said, this is war. Uh, and unfortunately, we have a war in which the the military, the folks who are right now taking care of the patients are ba being told basically you're on your own for getting your own protective equipment. And by the way, we're cutting about 40 to 50 percent of your budget to be able to do that. So this is a significant financial challenge. One last okay. thing, David, on that, if I could remember, hospitals in America are always the first or second largest employers in cities across America. And so if America's hospitals are not financially strong going forward, not only will we not have world class hospitals, but there are just hundreds of thousands, millions of people that make their livelihood on that industry. We have to come back and address this. To be clear, it is our people first, patients and our associates, financial second. But there will be a time after COVID to have this financial talk. Okay, well, um, this is very uh, sobering. And I want to thank you both for giving us uh, your time and all the work you are doing. And please convey our, our uh, appreciation for all your healthcare workers and to your families for uh, having to to deal with all of this. So thank you for your time. And obviously, if anybody in the Economic Club of Washington wants to be supportive, uh, they can contact your offices and they can uh, participate in the employee uh, support funds that you have put together. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And to my friend, Dr. Jones, thank you very much for your support. We're here for each other. Indeed, this right. has been a time we pulled together. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, David. All right. So we are now going to go to another panel of individuals. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, are the other panelists ready? I think we haven't had the, uh, oh, now we're joining by video. Okay. Okay. All right, so we have uh, Jane Adams, Everett Eisenstadt, and Gina Adams. I don't see Gina. I guess she'll be coming on in a second. There she is. Okay. Great. So let me give an introduction uh, to these three panelists, if I could. Um, Gina Adams uh, is the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at FedEx, and she's been in that position. Uh, she joined FedEx in 1992 and been in this position since 2001, and she's well known for her active involvement in the community, the native of the Washington area, but also for her active involvement, of course, in the Economic Club of Washington. Um, you don't have to have the last name Adams in order to be on this panel, but uh, we do have another Adams, and that's Jane Adams. And Jane is the Vice President for U.S. Federal Government Affairs for Johnson & Johnson, which is the nation's largest healthcare company. And she is uh, a, a, not a native of this area, but she uh, went to, got her graduate work done at Georgetown and has been here for a number of years. And she joined Jensen, Johnson & Johnson in 2003 and was promoted to her current position in 2016. She previously had been at Medtronics. And then uh, Everett Eisenstadt, um, who is um, uh, the Senior Vice President for Global Public Policy of General Motors. He previously had worked in both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And he is a graduate of uh, many different schools, but uh, did his undergraduate work at Oklahoma State and his law degree at University of Oklahoma. And uh, I wanna thank all of you for making uh, time available to us today 
talk about what you're doing. So why don't we just start by asking uh, each of you, what is your company's biggest focus right now on, on COVID-19? What is your company doing uh, right now to help on the COVID-19 problem? Why don't we start with Gina Adams? First of all, thank you, David, for having uh, me represent FedEx. Uh, I do want to quote our chairman, who you know, uh, and he has said, this is who we are, and this is what we do. Um, FedEx has been on the front, for, forefront of so many disasters, at least uh, as many as I can remember. Of course, you've heard already the thing this morning that these are unprecedented times. And uh, we are one of the only companies in the world that has the networks and capabilities uh, to keep commerce and aid moving. And that's only because uh, we are an essential service and because of the help of our 475,000 employees, and I'm not just, I'm talking about couriers and pilots and package handlers um, around the world, uh, we have been able uh, to deliver aid and uh, supplies to keep the economy moving and to help ensure that communities and hospitals have the critical supplies they need. I see. Now, Gina, um, have you had to lay off employees because business is down, or you've had to hire more employees because more people are sending things through FedEx? Of course, it's more of the latter. Uh, we, have, uh, we have not had to lay off any employees at this point. In fact, because of all the business that we're doing, um, we've had to bring on some employees. Of course, we're waiting to see what happens down the road. Uh, we, we all are anticipating that things are going to get a little bit worse and better. And you saw the jobless rates today. So right now, we're we're in good shape. Um, but we'll see what happens as we uh, continue to try to deal with this situation. Okay, uh, Jane. Uh, let's talk about Johnson and Johnson for a moment. Um, Johnson and Johnson's right at the forefront of this. Um, and uh, what are you doing to work on a vaccine? I, I understand that you are. Uh, with the federal government working on coming up with a vaccine if possible. Uh, we are, and thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, with uh, my, my peers, my colleagues, um, a real privilege um, to share what our company and other companies are doing to address the crisis. And I think you know, Johnson & Johnson, we are the largest and most diversified healthcare company in the world with 133,000 employees. Um, we touch over a billion patients and consumers a day. So we have a responsibility um, to, to do all we can. And while I'll talk about the vaccine development in a moment, I think to quote our CEO and Chairman Alex Gorski, you know, Johnson & Johnson is built for this. This is a, a crisis that we have been engaged in from the beginning. We have already a robust and proven track record in vaccine development. So on Monday, um, Alex uh, announced an extended partnership with uh, the government, with BARDA, the biomedical advanced research and development authority um, to partner on a billion dollars for our lead vaccine candidate. We actually have several that we're working on, but we have one that is so promising that we've accelerated that timeline. So it'll be in human trials. It's in animal trials right now. It's in it'll be in human trials at the latest by September. And then we're hoping um, that, that with uh, the, the expected and, and hopeful um, progress that it will be available um, globally by the beginning of 2021. And, and again, remember Johnson & Johnson has a proven track record of vaccines. We've already instituted a, the Ebola vaccine in West Africa. We have phase two and phase three uh, trials in TB, RSV, HIV. So we already had a platform that allows us to accelerate um, and adapt right. to this novel uh, coronavirus. Now, have you had to lay off people uh, as a result of decline in business in some parts of your business, or are you hiring more people, or is everything is stable? Um, everything is, is the same. I think what we've been able to do is internally be able to convert certain manufacturing, for example, to produce um, more hand sanitizer, for example. We also manufacture Tylenol, and there's you know a, a, an exponential um, uh, consumption of Tylenol um, because of some of the symptoms of the virus. So we're able to you know, move within the, the existing confines of J&J. &J. And I also want to 
say our partnership on our supply chain, our global supply chain is over 60,000 employees um, and partnering with um, great organizations and partners like FedEx has allowed us to make sure that we're um, addressing patient and consumer needs. Okay, now Everett, uh, your company makes automobiles and trucks among other things, but now you're making ventilators. I mean, how are you mm -hmm. qualified to be making ventilators to be honest? Well, you know, David, it's a great question. And first, uh, let me just thank you for, for having us on on behalf of General Motors. I know Mary Barra uh, really made the mantra for us when this crisis start, started uh, uh, rolling across the country that we needed to be able to do the right things for our communities, our workers, our customers, our stakeholders, and, and do everything we can to be part of the solution. So in addition to all the work we're doing to ensure you know successful operations, serving our customers, to the best we can through our connectivity, through our OnStar system, and making sure our dealers are open so if they need car repair, they're able to do that. We've also taken on a challenge um, that really started with a phone call. There's an organization called Stop the Spread that has been working hard to connect um, manufacturers to uh, those with the intellectual property and, and, and help them ramp up production to get the kind of uh, assets we need at the hospitals. I, I saw on your show earlier this morning that ventilators can be a real problem and we want to be part of the solution. So it all started with a phone call. On March 18th, uh, we got a call from Stop the Spread. My CEO immediately left in action, um, talked to the CEO of Ventec, which is a small manufacturing company in Washington. We had a, a, a group on the ground within that weekend working around the clock to see what we could do and really reached out to our supply chain, uh, which was incredibly responsive and said, okay, how do we help a company that is producing 200 ventilators a month ramp up to you know, uh, tens of thousands of ventilators a month? And in order to do that, you need a robust supply chain. And the, the automotive supply chain was very responsive. We were able to source about 100% um, of the 700 parts needed within 72 hours. We have a, a facility in Kokomo, Indiana, where we are training union workforce along with salary workforce, volunteers, paid volunteers, but volunteering to be there and take on this challenge to get these up and going as quick, quickly as possible. So you're going to make about 10000 a month, uh, is that right, if you can? That, that's, that's right. And it takes a while to ramp up to that level, but we're well on our way. We should so have when you make going. When you make ventilators, do they come in different options or colors yes. like your cars, or it's all one the same? <laughs> We're, we're, we're focused on utility right now. We'll look at design a bit later, um, but that's a great question. I'm sure we can do a Corvette of ventilators that will be uh, quite So um, people, are not, people are not buying a lot of cars these days, so you've had to lay off some of your workers, but people apparently are buying a lot of pickup trucks. Why is that? Well, you know, it's a great question, David. I don't have the exact answer. I will give you a hypothesis. I think that there are other areas of the country that are not feeling the effects as rapidly. So pickup sales tend to be, uh, you know, middle America and the rural areas. Um, so I suspect, you know, we've got, we've, we've instituted some great financing options because we know people are under stress. It could be that uh, part of it. Um, I think the coasts are being hit more proportionally harder and so i suspect sales have uh, fallen on the coast where pickup sales are not always as strong so at, at one point president trump wasn't happy with general motors now he seems to be happy is that where the current state is we were always happy to be helping the federal government and working with the president and his team and yeah, you know, we get frustrated and I'm, I'm sure he does as well the pace of change we need to uh, engage okay. in is, is tough but we're working hard all right now gina um I didn't want to leave the impression that you were so busy that you're just doing this for profit. I assume you're giving away a lot of your services and you're doing a lot of things uh, in a mercenary way. Can you describe some of those things? Sure. <clears throat> We've worked with a lot of our uh, uh, philanthropic partners, Direct Relief, uh, the American Red Cross, to do to make a lot of uh, uh, philanthropic uh, delivery. So. Um, we've done quite a bit of that. We're also doing quite a lot with the U.S. government to provide uh, test kit sample transportation for remote COVID-19 test sites across the U.S. Over uh, 10 days, we ship more than 60,000 COVID uh, test samples from remote test sites to labs uh, for analysis. Um, we've designed an, an operation inclusive of dedicated 
um, airline networks and specialized pickup and delivery uh, operations and associated ground transportation uh, to receive the samples uh, from various test sites. And we're delivering those to uh, LabCorp and Crestland, you heard them referred to today. And we're doing a lot of this, David, yes, philanthropically, but we're also you know, getting paid for a lot of our services with the U.S. government. Uh, we're moving uh, shipments uh, through um, what's called SenseAware, and this technology allows us to constantly monitor what's happening with these uh, test kits um, through what we call uh, Project AirBridge. Uh, FedEx is supporting FEMA and the State Department in coordinated commercial uh, charter flights to transport PPEs uh, uh, around the world. Uh, we have the first of two supporting flights scheduled for next week, um, where we will be transporting PPEs from Vietnam uh, to the United States. Uh, we've been working with HHS and the Tennessee Air um, National Guard and other agencies uh, to move COVID uh, 19 test kits and as a matter of fact i was at the white house meeting with the president and the vice president and others in his administration last sunday uh, there were a number of distributors there who were trying to push the their products out to make sure that they get to where they need to be and uh, i was there to talk about the logistics aspect of all of that and uh and to make sure that those uh, products are, are moving through our system smoothly. When you were at the White House, were you wearing gloves and masks? And how close could everybody get to everybody? I mean, did, did, you, get to, did you shake the hand of the president or you didn't I do that? I did not shake the hand of the president. They practice uh, very good uh, social physical distancing. We had our temperature taken uh, before we entered the White House. And then again, once we got inside, there was plenty of sanitizing equipment around that we use constantly. I washed my hands uh, several times uh, and the seating was far enough apart that I think that uh, we were following uh, uh, okay. World Health Organization CDC guidelines. Okay, uh, Jane, um, what is J&J uh, &J doing philanthropically? Uh, what Are you giving away some medical supplies or what are you doing uh, in an Elon Mossonary way? Sure. So we were um, very engaged early on back in January, gave over a million masks um, to China alone. We don't make the masks, we don't make the PPE, but obviously as large manufacturers and diversified manufacturers, we have significant PPE that we already own. Um, so we don't make those, but, but what we've really been able to do um, is focus on the frontline health workers. And that's a platform that J&J &J has had traditionally for many, many years. Um, you've probably seen on television our ads uh, about the nursing campaign, Amer a campaign for America's um, nurses and nursing future. But we really recognize the burden on the healthcare worker and the frontline healthcare worker. And so we've contributed almost $300 million um, to frontline health workers through the World Health Organization, through COVID Solidarity Response Fund. Um, we also have matching funds for our employees. So when the employees make a contribution, um, that, that also um, uh, goes, the company will match that. I see. And so our contributions are not only product donation, um, which we again continue to do, but also um, a recent $1.5 million donation to the American Nurses Foundation um, to help with their education and, uh, and okay. access. And I will also say when our, with the vaccine development, we've made it very known that that will be not-for-profit pricing. Uh, especially during the pandemic. And so we think that making sure that it's accessible and affordable globally is very, very important and core to Johnson & Johnson's credo. So one of the uh, lessons that some people have taken away from all of this is that our uh, medical equipment, PPE equipment, is often dependent on manufacturing in China, among other places. Uh, do you think, and when this is all over, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will manufacture more things in the United States that we need for these kind of emergencies, or you think it won't really change things? Well, I can tell you on our vaccine development, one of the commitments was to uh, erect U.S. manufacturing. And so while we do this globally and we have partners all over the world, 
for our vaccine development and manufacturing, we will be, again, instituting U.S. manufacturing immediately upon um, authorization. So that's something that will be, you know, new to us for the vaccine space. But, you know, I think that we're, as, as my peers have, have said, we are recognizing the need for global connectivity, um, and, but the U.S. manufacturing base is significant and one that will um, you know, continue to grow. Okay, uh, Everett, let me ask you about General Motors. Um, it's been publicized, of course, that you're making ventilators, but are you not making some other products as well in the healthcare system? Absolutely, David, and thanks. Thank you for the question. It's really, um, we want to serve the local, we're, First, our collaboration with the federal government has been great. It's ongoing, it's daily, it's intense. I mean, we have phone calls back and forth with different agencies. It's complicated to ramp something up this quickly, but the kind of collaboration we've had has been very inspiring and we, we appreciate that. We're also using a facility in uh, Michigan to produce masks for uh, the, 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 the hospital, the types of needs you, you heard this morning. Uh, we're gonna start production next week. Um, we're gonna start with about, I think, we're going from uh, 20,000 next week, and then we're going to be up to 10,000 a month. We'll have, uh, once we're up to total production, we'll be doing 1.5 million uh, masks a month. So those are going to be available for uh, local communities, for the federal government. Um, and I can say that the, the kind of grassroots support we've gotten from our uh, GM employees is, is astonishing. They're, they're, they've set up a network for distribution. They're donating, as you mentioned, some of your employees are donating uh, money, they're going to blood banks, they really want to be part of the solution, and it's really inspiring to be a, with a company that has the ability to, to, to have an impact and make a contribution like this. Now, of the companies where, that are on this panel, um, your company is probably going to be the most adversely affected by this because I assume automobile production and sales are going to be way down. Um, is that likely to be the case? You expect a financial hit from all of this? Well, it doesn't, it's, it's certainly going to be, it's going to be a transition for sure. I think the way, what we've been hearing candidly, almost immediately, is not just the automobile industry, but remembering the whole integrated supply chain and how many small suppliers rely on the auto companies for their livelihood. So I think that's where you might see the first immediate impact. So the stimulus package you went through was a very good start for a lot of those companies. We are in pretty good shape. Uh, we, my CEO has been very diligent in preparing for something like this. If, if it stays prolonged, it's hard to make money when your factories are not producing cars and your dealers can't sell cars. So what we hope for, flatten the curve, quick response, uh, keep our employee base ready to go. We talk every day about how do we be ready to ramp up as soon as we can and be ready to get this economy charging again because uh, we think we can come out of it pretty good, uh, but it's not something that's gonna happen on its own. We need to be prepared for it. So I buy a new car roughly every 20 years or so. So if I was going to buy one now, is this a good time to buy one? Am I going to get a good price? Well, we have our friends and family. I think you might qualify. Uh, but even beyond that, we, we also have um, uh, a great financing right now through GM Financial because it, it is a difficult time for, for people to shop for cars. We're actually making those available uh, through our dealer network. They'll actually come to your house. There's all kinds of car now if a dealer dealerships open or people coming in or what are they doing they wearing gloves when they come in or what well as i was just saying many of the dealers now can actually go online dealing and deliver the car to your house so you don't even need to go to the dealership and if you have a okay. particular model you're interested in i'm happy to connect you with somebody all right well i understand you have zero percent financing which is pretty attractive that's also. right for, yep for 84 months and uh, we've got some great new vehicles we just brought out so so, Gina, what are you doing personally through this uh, crisis? Are you working out of your home or when you're not going to the White House to meet with the president? What are you doing? So, yes, I'm mostly working out of the home, although I'm in the office today. Don't tell anybody. Uh, I'm the only one here. Uh, we're trying to be very strict, uh, spending a lot of time uh, talking to our, uh, our folks in China. Uh, we're constantly changing our uh, schedules to meet the demands. Uh, coming from around the world. So I am on the phone. Um, I've already had uh, probably about five or six conference calls this morning uh, with our Asia folks trying to get some things moving out of there and they go uh, through the night. Um, and one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about, David, 
is the big things that you all hear about in the news, the products that we're moving, the tons of uh, uh, equipment that we're moving around the world. But there are a lot of um, other things that we're doing outside the healthcare. We're uh, shipping household supplies, and I hope that the audience uh, is using FedEx to get some of those. Uh, we're shipping care packages to cruise ships. Um, we have been utilized by a lot of colleges and universities uh, with various colleges and universities move out requirements. And you will be happy to know, uh, because I chair the education committee and you're so generous and, and your support of DC public school students that uh, we have had large print orders from DC public schools associated with COVID-19 school closures and in fact, um, this newly launched uh, learning program um, allowed our team to uh, deliver uh, a few million uh, pages last Monday for the program. So uh, we're doing everything with respect to FedEx and we get a lot of calls from, from members of Congress and the administration, uh, administration officials who are trying to get things around the world and we've been helpful in that respect. But we've also done a lot of little things um, uh, to help um, uh, folks in tough situations. And I have to brag on one of our FedEx team members who did a print job, but also helped the customer get, of all things, toilet paper. So if I need to send a package to somebody, can I go to my local FedEx store? Are they open now and I can go in there? Do I wear gloves or what do I do? Yeah, you can, they are open. We're open for business. Um, they're open. We're practicing all of us uh, social and physical uh, distancing that's required. You should wear gloves. We're requiring our people to wear gloves. There should be lots of sanitizers around. Uh, we're sanitizing our, our facilities constantly, our trucks, our drivers, our airplanes. So you should be safe. Okay. So uh, Jane, what are you doing? Are you working out of your house or what, what is the normal policy now for J&J &J employees? Yeah, so J&J &J has, has required all uh, who, who can, who may, uh, to work from home and that's been in place since the middle of March. Um, so I'm home, um, but we are, you know, enabled by great technology to be able to stay in touch with our teams. Um, doing Zoom and, and video conferencing as, as we're doing right now, because it's so important to make sure that we're staying in touch with, with all of our employees around the globe. And like Gina, you know, are in touch uh, with our Asia colleagues um, constantly, as well as um, Europe, Europe and Latin America. So it's really global connections. I'd say for me, I have a 15, we have 15 and, and 11 year olds. So there's lots more noise, a lot of video games, uh, homeschooling. Um, but it's been an adjustment, but everyone's um, hanging in there and, and I think a lot of similar stories. And some of the silver linings is that you actually get to be a little bit more engaged with, uh, with your family and who lives under, under the roof as, as challenging as it could be. But um, j and J is really providing us with great capabilities to stay in touch with teams globally. So you're not getting stir crazy yet? <laughs> Oh, we're, no, no, I, we definitely are getting stir crazy. Uh, this was supposed to be spring break week, um, but we're trying to find alternatives. Uh, you know, the fields in Virginia and parks are all closed. Um, so we go outside and shoot baskets and run around the, the yard and uh, do what we can, working out in the basement, lots of movie nights, Scrabble games, Monopoly. Um, so that that's actually been been nice, but it's been very, very busy at J&J, &J, similar to Everett When you work at J&J, &J, do you get free free band-aids or you don't get those discounts they're not free they, they are discounted on the company store so like everett okay. I, I think i can get you a deal if you you need anything okay. but we have <laughs> lots right. of good products so everett where are you working out of your home your office uh a dealership where no we're we're uh, all the salaried employees that can work from home are working from home and uh, we're pretty adamant about the safety of our of our workforce and, and took these guidelines on or applying them uh, pretty strictly. Um, you know, if they're in the manufacturing sector, the unionized workforce or some of our engineers and designers need to be on site. And we are taking unprecedented safety precautions, um, including, you know, spacing and sanitizing and how many people can be in a, a facility at one time. Um, 
I, I'm not in one of those facilities. I'm working from home, and it, as, as Gina uh, says, and it's been incredibly busy. Um, our IT system has worked flawlessly, and I'm very impressed with their ability to keep us all connected. In many ways, I probably talk to the global team more frequently than I did when we were you know, running back and forth on the Detroit DC shuttle. So it's, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, going great for now, we'll see in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll, we can revisit it. Okay, let me thank all three of you for uh, taking your time to uh, both be members of the club, but also to participate in this. Uh, what we're trying to do is to let other members of the economic club and others who are watching from the diplomatic community or other economic clubs in other cities to know what other companies are doing, how they're dealing with the philanthropic uh, needs, and also how they're keeping their business going. And I think you gave us a very good cross section. I want to thank you for doing that. Um, this entire uh, uh, broadcast, in effect, will be uh, on our website, www.economicclub.org, uh, very shortly after this is uh, completed. And uh, we have another broadcast, our virtual broadcast next week, as I mentioned, with Dina. Dina Friedman, who is uh, the head of NASDAQ, and also with Ted Gare, who's a, a senior fellow in economics at the Brookings Institution. That'll be next Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the morning, 10, 10 in the morning. So if any of you have any questions for the Economic Club, you can send them to us on our website. I want to thank Mary Brady and all the other people who worked with her for organizing this. And again, thank you, Everett. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Gina, for participating. And thank you for what you're doing during this crisis. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, David. Thanks, Thank Gina you. Jane. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you guys.